This is Matt Brown, and you're listening to Just a Good Conversation. You would think, after more than 35 years of shooting basketball, you would have done and seen it all. My guest, Nathaniel Butler, has seen and done it all, but still has the drive to make a better photo every day he walks onto the court. Hard work is a family trait, and Nate wears it like a badge of honor. I was working with Sports Illustrated, and as a senior in college, I got tasked with working on part of the, of the bathing suit issue for Sports Illustrated. And I was like, this, this is not terrible. This is, <laughs> go to law school, the library, or I was actually tasked with taking Polaroids of the, the women as they came in for fittings for uh, a swimsuit issue. I was like, eh, as, a, as a 20 year old, that's not terrible. I'm Matt Brown, host of Just a Good Conversation. Take a listen to our archives. Our guests have ranged from Hall of Fame basketball players, business owners, and former Major League pitcher Ricky Romero. This is a part that, that Ken Revisa did really good. Like, we're not going to let up. And I, I'm in killer instinct mode. Like, we won one, but no, I want more. You know, and, and that's kind of... And Cesar Ramos and I had a special relationship to this day. We still do. We're still great friends. That I wanted to beat him. And he wanted to beat me. You know, so, so we had that kind of going and and again it's it's long beach fullerton games um you know you get those i i always say it and and my parents always say remember how full those stadiums would be every friday saturday and sunday and i was like yeah yeah it was it was it was amazing to watch the rest of my conversation with ricky can be found on our archives at justagoodconversation.com let's take a quick break from my sponsor before diving into my conversation with nat butler I am uh, more than excited. I get to speak to a man who I haven't seen. I don't know if you remember. We met the last time the Lakers played the Celtics in L.A. a million years ago. We won't even date ourselves. But I got Mr. Butler with me on the podcast today. How are you, sir? Everything is great. No, thanks for having me. A long time coming. We've been we've been trying to coordinate schedules, but I'm excited to be here. Well, I, I know the life of an NBA photographer, and your schedule is crazy to be nice and polite about it. It's bonkers. Right. Yeah. Oh, uh, it's not easy. Could you ever believe the schedule you live today when you started in the 80s? Like, like, this is how the NBA would be? You know what? I I couldn't imagine. Like, I don't know what has happened, but the, <laughs> se- like, the season is, is crazy. Like, it starts, camps open September. We go heavy. It goes through June. The draft, end of June, 4th of July off. NBA Summer League is now the hugest, craziest uh, thing ever. Like, it, that used to be nothing. Now it's a huge thing. That goes into August. Um, this year there's no Olympic or World Cup or anything, which is nice. <laughs> um, next year there, next year there's qualifiers, and, and following in, in 24, it's Paris. Um, so it is crazy. I haven't done... Last year I did two WNBA games. I enjoyed doing the W, um, but just based on my schedule, uh, I have that has been limited over the past few years for sure. Yeah, I mean, if someone would have sat you down, Nate, and said, "Listen, uh, young man, I know it's 1985, six, seven, but if you think it's going to be this easy for the rest of your life, you get another thing coming." <laughs> uh, no, it's 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 kind of it's kind of crazy. Um, but you know what? I, I am very fortunate. I've been doing it a long time. I still, I love it. I driving into the games, uh, I get pumped up. Like what's tonight's matchup? Like I, I still, uh, I still love it. So I'm, I'm very fortunate in that regard. Have you always been an East coast guy? Have you always grown up and lived on the East coast? Yes. Yeah. Um, I have, uh, I grew up in a, in a very small town all the way East, um, my dad was a fisherman, actually. Wow. Um, so I can never, I can, I can never complain about working hard. Right. You know, I, as a kid growing up, uh, I remember two days of my dad uh, not going to work my entire childhood. So it, it's kind of a crazy, um, a crazy story there. Uh, but grew up there. I, I played. I loved basketball. 
Obviously, um, you have no choice, right? Played, played, <laughs> played basketball. Uh, I went to St. John's. Yeah, uh, in New York, not correct? Good enough. Yeah, not good enough to, uh, in those days, St. John's was like Chris Mullen, Walter Berry, Mark Jack. St. John's was like number one, number two with Patrick Ewing, Georgetown yeah. years. Um, so I was not good enough, obviously, uh, to play on that team. So uh, how was that for you, though? Like, just think of college life. How was that to be at a school where it was an absolute power? That must have been awesome. You know what? It 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 lent me like we all have our paths. You know, um, I was interested in photography at a very young age, uh, and interested in sports. So it was kind of like the merging of those two worlds. Who? Now that I was no longer like, you know, playing at a high level of basketball, so I started shooting. I was hanging out in the gym all the time. I would shoot the games. Uh, St. John's, like I said, was ranked high. So they had a home game or they played a lot of their home games at Madison Square Garden. Okay. Um, so then I would bump into a Sports Illustrated photographer covering the game because that was, a you know, literally one and two in the country kind of. Big East in the 80s was a crazy oh scene. Oh, my God. Yeah. Um, so bump into those guys, started working as an assistant uh, for their basketball shooters, Manny, Manny Milan, primarily John Iacono, people like that, Heinz Klut, my like, so that sort of like just happenstance with my path. Jeez. Uh, take me back. Who was the influence for photography? Was it dad, grandpa? What was the, what was the spark? <clears throat> you know what? It's a crazy story. Um, I didn't know my grandfather, okay. um, but when he passed going through his, uh, his stuff uh he was in the navy and he had he had picked he was in pearl harbor when pearl harbor was bombed he was a, a engineer on one of the boats uh and he survived but his his hobby at the time as a i guess he was a machinist on in the navy was photography and there were these crazy photos that we came across uh, after he had passed that he had taken uh, in Pearl Harbor right after the bombing. Um, The quality, like amazing quality. uh, And I guess it was just his, his hobby. So kind of a weird, maybe some genetics at play there, you know? (laughs) Um, But I typically was, I was a huge sports fan, um, but I would typically, you know, Sports Illustrated was the holy grail for me as a kid uh, growing up, both reading. They had a tremendous staff of writers in addition to the photographer. Oh, yeah. I would li- literally run to the mailbox every Thursday to get Sports Illustrated, read it cover to cover, tear out uh, the pictures, hanging the pictures up all over my room, you know, uh, and that that was what, what started my love of photography and then sports photography in particular. Yeah. It, people don't realize who used to write for that magazine, like Frank DeFord or Thompson. Oh, like, um, like it, yeah. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Like I obviously we're visual photographer, but the writing in that magazine also drew me in. It was stunning. Yes. Oh. yes. And I, and they like almost every issue, there was a longer form. It wasn't like, obviously, uh, for the audience here, there was no ESPN. There was no, like, it was a weekly magazine that you would find out about, you know, your sports through the, through the magazine. Uh, but then typically every week or two, a crazy long form feature on one of the hot, uh, athletes of the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, and those like were crazy in depth. Oh. Well written, like every one of their, uh, in addition to the photographers, every one of their writers was like an award-winning uh, yeah. Yeah. writer, you know. Uh, and I, I was fortunate even when I started assisting to work with one of the photographers that did those types of uh, profiles, Lane Stewart. Oh yeah, uh, he was he was on staff at Sports Illustrated, and he never went to a game. I don't think his entire career, he would do those feature things. And I learned so much because that was a foreign, that was totally foreign to me, you know, because I was in the game and the event kind of uh, world, but to, 
to be able to work with him, lighting portraits, getting to know people. He was a great schmoozer, just getting people to relax around him in the environment, you know, um, and they spent a lot of time with the subject. Oftentimes, like he would say, we're going to go to dinner with this guy. And I'm like, what? Like he wouldn't even take a camera out for the first couple of hours. He wanted that comfort. And th those are things that I like, I was like in awe of learning and just like a big sponge absorbing all of that stuff. What a blessed place to have been. Yeah. yeah, it was amazing. It was truly amazing. Thank God you didn't go to Montana State. You wouldn't have known any of those guys. You know, I, I you know, it's different. I tell people this story. it's different. Um, with colleges and my kids now have gone through, I applied to two schools, Cornell and St. John's. I got into Cornell. I had no faith in my academics. Uh, and my parents were like, you're going to St. John's really Cornell is a pretty good school. Uh, but that, that sort of, you know, led my, led my path to, uh, I was interested in, I was in, I was a, I was a good student. Um, I was interested in law. I took the, the LSATs and stuff. I was going to maybe go to, could you make a living doing photography? I don't know. I'm still trying to figure it out 40 years later, if you can. Yeah. Different. Uh, but then I, as I said, I was working with Sports Illustrated and as a senior in college, I got tasked with working on part of the, of the bathing suit issue for Sports Illustrated. And I was like, this this is not terrible. This is, go to law school, the library, or I was actually tasked with taking Polaroids of the the women as they came in for fittings for uh, a swimsuit issue. I was like, eh, as a as a twenty year old, that's not terrible. No, you know? there's worse jobs. There's worse yeah, jobs exactly, that you could have exactly. been doing. Exactly. Plus, you're thinking, you know what? A poor photographer taking. Polaroids of half nude women in a swimsuit issue. Not a bad job at 20. Right. <laughs> right. No, it was kind of crazy. Like um, things were so secretive. I was like oh, holed yeah. up in a, in a hotel, a dumpy hotel out by JFK. They had women coming in and out, literally taking the old Polaroids, mm -hmm. trying on the fittings and stuff. And then I ended up not going on the, on, but they wouldn't tell anyone where the assignment was going to go. I want to say that year it could have been, it could have been like Walter shooting in Jamaica or something. Right. This was like, this was like 1983 or something. Um, but I didn't go on that. It, everything was top seat. It's crazy how things are different. Oh uh, yeah. How things are different. But having said that, those the I think a blind guy could have taken some good Polaroids of those those particular women. Well, it's like you said, it's interesting how that was treated. Like you were working for the Pentagon, for the love of God, right. you were shooting for a magazine. Right. But it was so right. important no, back top, then. Top, top, top secret uh, stuff, and like literally, they would come in for their for their fittings, and it was like narrowing down, you know, twenty suits to f five or six for each woman or something, right. you know. Because um, but I, it, was, yeah. it was pretty fun. The knowing, okay, location was important, and that was a secret. Which models were going to be on, Correct. Case, and the suits were totally right. important. Right, such right. a production back then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so that was a little different from Madison Square Garden. <laughs> so, I mean, were you thinking though? Like, at what point do you go? Okay. I'm all in. I'm going to put two feet and jump into the deep end of photography and I'm not doing law school. You know what? Um, yeah, it was, it was when you first started, like at the time getting a couple of assignments and I was working uh, as an assistant at sports illustrated, you know, because literally while I was in school, because I, like I said earlier, I kept bumping in just by happenstance. Hey, let's do this for the, are you available on the weekend or doing this or do, and so being in New York, I was able to do that while I was still in school. Right. And, and, you know, I want to say we were getting, we got a hundred dollars a day for, you know, to, to work. And I was like, wow, this is, this is pretty cool. Um, and I, I felt like it was just sort of took that turn. It was something I was passionate about. I was learning like literally like these were the, the, the best of the best yeah. photographers. Right. And I was, and I was fortunate enough to work with different guys 
like, and you pick up this from this guy, this from this guy, like it literally couldn't have been a better situation for me personally. I wasn't with one particular guy it would have been great, but literally a bunch of different guys. Oftentimes I was the last minute call. Oh, so-and-so call Nat. And I would work for this guy, that guy. And, but all of them like literally Titans in our industry. Yeah. And it was, a, it was, a, it was an amazing time for me. Can you imagine what, you know, those conversations were like for you back then where you could have just been like, I'm going to do this job for 40 years. I need to ask you all of these questions because I have no right. idea. Like, right. No. It's and it's weird. Education. It's like, right. And you don't think in those days, you don't think long term, you think about paying rent yeah. that month. Literally. Yeah. You know, I was like, I was like, wow. I don't like, you know, Manny, I would work with Manny or Johnny or one of the photographers and, and they would buy me dinner. I was like, this is the greatest thing ever. <laughs> like they, they bought dinner at a know? good place too. Uh, and most times at a good, at a good place. Um, and then, you know, things, th things were just different. I would go into the time life building was Mecca oh. because for those, for a younger audience, Time Life was Sports Illustrated, but it was also Life Magazine, People Magazine. All of these places were all in one building on different floors. You know, uh, I would see Alfred Eisenstadt in the hallway. Like, things like that were just for, a, again, a young, you know, 20-something was a truly remarkable uh, experience for me. Wow. Um, and, I, and I was you know, smart enough to just sit back and absorb everything about it, you know, because it was, it was a great time. And then, you know, like the guys knew that I was interested in photography. Um, so someone like Manny or Walter would, when you're done with a shoot, if they gave me, if there were two extra rolls of film that they didn't use on the shoot, they would give me two rolls of film was like gold. I couldn't afford to oh. like, film and process my own film. So now we appreciate you. Like here's two rolls of film was like, it's like literally better than giving someone money or gold. <laughs> like that's what I needed to then on a off day, go do something because uh, I was learning and screwing up and overexposing, underexposing film and, you know, things like that. So, so being able to just, you know, a silly thing like that uh, meant the world to me. Wow. I mean, it's hard for people to understand, like just getting those rolls of film, how big that was, that ability right. now to go out and either you practice your craft or have that extra film in the bag. That, right. That is just like, it's hard to really put your head around it. Right, right. No, because we all started out shooting black and white. <laughs> uh, so we would buy, you know, Tri-X was the, was the, the Kodak Tri-X was, and then literally converted the closet in my, in my dumpy New York apartment into a, into a dark room. You, you did? Develop, yeah. Oh like boy. Developing, developing film in your head. You put up the shower, the shower rod and you have the. <laughs> The, the film hey and they're like this is great this is great you look at it closely shit it, like a little soft you know <laughs> like you have to you were learning yeah. so then you doing that i worked you know for the school newspaper things like that but then the next the next step in that process was shooting you know kodachrome or something like that the color film and that was that was literally gold uh in those days wow that is, yeah, people don't get it. People don't get that learning curve. It, right. It's, right. Un, it's unbelievable. Where did you start to feel like, okay, now I'm assisting. What's my next step? What are you thinking like right. in two years? Just two years, not even five, ten. Right. No, as, as again, and it was all timing, different circumstance. Um, as part of my curriculum at school, we had to do – uh, an internship our last semester. Okay. Um, so I, I started looking around in the New York area and ultimately I ended up doing an internship uh, at the NBA. I knew, knew a guy there uh, and he said, sure, come on in. I was, I was interested in baseball. My best friend from college went to MLB. Okay. Uh, 
she has been at MLB for 40 years now, which is kind of <laughs> crazy. I went, to, I went to the NBA uh, and I worked for in the PR department. They didn't have a, they didn't have a no. photo department. Right. Um, but, and I would do, I was doing clips and the NBA, I want to, the NBA has 30 teams now. I want to say back then it could have been 26, maybe. I don't, I'm not even sure. They would get newspapers in the New York office from every local market. <laughs> and my job, I would walk in and there were stacks of newspaper. I had to clip out articles of interest, go to the Xerox machine, tape them, go to the Xerox machine, and then deliver them to the head of PR or literally three doors down was David Stern's office. Okay. And he wanted, he wanted the morning clips and it was literally um, every team, like whether it was Denver, Los Angeles, uh, every Boston globe, like Boston globe had crazy photographers on staff uh, crazy writers on staff. We're talking about mid eighties, the uh, early eighties. Right. This was 1984. So I got yelled at a few times because I was too slow because I was also, I was also looking at the photos from all of these crazy talented newspaper photographers in the eighties as um as I was doing the news clips and sports clips. Because you cared. You were, you were lost. No, I was like, wow, that's a crazy picture of Larry Bird or magic. Like, and you look back on it and it's, it's, it is a little bit like a, like a, a fairy tale story in that regard, because, and I know you, you talked with John a lot about on, on John Beaver on a previous podcast about the talent in those years that were at some of the different uh, newspapers across the country. Right. You know, uh, and it was remarkable how talented those photographers were. Um, and I would, see, I would literally, part of my internship was uh, getting together those news articles, and I'm taking a peek at all the, at all the action uh, sports photos as well at the same time. <laughs> They should have had someone who did not care about photography doing that, right. but they had the guy right. that was absolutely like all in. No, it was fine. I, and I would read the art, like on the subway home, I would, I would read the, uh, I would read the articles, you know, and know how the Celtics were doing and the Lakers were doing with magic Johnson. And, you know, this hot shot rookie magic Johnson in 1983, you know, right. Of course uh, that, that so, guy, um, yeah, exactly. Exactly. So how did that, did that, was that the genesis for then staying within the NBA family? You know what they, um, I was working for the PR group. Um, and it's sort of, like I said, they, there was no such thing as a photo department, but they would ha occasionally have uh, a press conference or an event and they knew I was in for, into photography. So it's sort of as part of my, you know, my internship and some of my responsibilities, like in those, those years, the NBA was trying to grow internationally. Right. They would have people, people in the office and something even as goofy as, you know, there, there are people from Australia here, David Stern and the international group wants to take a picture. So I would walk down with my little, you know, my little Nikon Vivitar 283 and, you know, pray to God that I didn't screw it up. Um, you know, take, taking, uh, you know, pictures of the handshake or a contract signing of things like that, you know? Um, so that was, that was an incredible experience. So then it went from there. They knew I was, I worked for sports illustrated like nights and weekends it went from that to, hey, you think I could get a pass to go to the Knicks game? Um, and working in conjunction with, again, the NBA wanted some stuff internally okay. because they were they were really making a push internationally at the time uh, to promote the the product right. of NBA basketball. Right. You know, um, and there there recently had been within the NBA circles. Um, a video division that was started like two years prior. Okay. 
uh, because David Stern was big on, you know, archiving the history of uh, the NBA. So it was a similar parallel in that the video thing had started a year or two earlier. I was like, you know, we really should, uh, we should start some kind of photo group here um, with, with just, just having a history and some type of, of archive. Right. I mean, uh, you, you know, this, this is crazy to even say this, but let's say this is 85, six, seven years earlier, NBA's tape delayed on the finals. And right. there's, and in the seventies, there's some great teams. Things are wild, like unbelievable, crazy teams are we winning. Portland's winning. Seattle's winning the, the right. Washington bolts. There's no real record of that stuff. Like how the NFL films recorded that stuff. Right. Right. The NBA, and I think that's, yeah, right, and I think I think the NBA, um, the NBA uh, entertainment video division took a page out of NFL films about hey we we have to start, you know we have to start documenting this and then archiving this. They weren't talking about you know selling or any right. of that. It was more like this this is something special that's going on here. Uh, we need we need to start documenting this right because if you don't do it who is right and that's where again just through happenstance i'm in new york uh andy bernstein had was in la and he had done a couple of things for the nba a year or two prior um and it was like okay we have an east coast and a west coast let's maybe try to get some kind of thing together here where somebody's he's shooting all the Laker and Clipper games. And then I started shooting more and more Knicks and at the time, uh, New Jersey Nets games. Right. Um, and it was again, just, just to archive and have some kind of, of uh, history of, of what was going on. You shoot the visiting teams coming through. There were no travel budgets, right. you no. know, in those days. You know, we would, Andy and I would both meet up and shoot the all-star game and finals. That would be about it, you know, but typically just shooting teams as they're coming through. Um, Was there any direction? Like, did they say, okay, guys, get the coach, get the starting five, the um, overall? You know what? Uh, Limited, limited direction, to be honest. But, but again, at the time, there was a big, uh, big demand. They wanted to push things internationally, you know. So there were certain storylines that we were working with uh, the NBA communications PR people, and then later there was an NBA international division uh, that would give us some, uh, you know, some guidelines about what what they were looking for in particular. How how raw was your gear back then when you started? Like, what were you using? You know what? Initially, uh, old Nikons, I had, like, FM2. Mm-hmm. Um, and there was an F1, uh, just shooting black and white. Um, and then we we evolved into into shooting with, uh, with strobe that I had become familiar with. Uh, with that from the guys at Sports Illustrated, right? You know, learning learning from them. So that, that was a pretty important uh, skill set for me to have because at the time they were pretty much the only guys that were doing. Oh that. yeah, no, you know, that was still no, magic. No one, no one, no one was doing that, and no one really understood uh, what it took. The equipment involved. Uh, and I was familiar with that, so that helped. Uh, that helped considerably. Yeah, that's a big leg up for you to be like, okay, right. I can, I can put these up. I know what zip line yeah. means. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. A lot of sh- a lot of schlepping. Yeah. Uh, of things, and the, the good friend uh, of mine, Lou Capazzola, in those days was he was on staff as an as an SI assistant, yeah. and we literally. We traveled all over the country. It's he was a big hockey guy, and uh-huh. I was a big basketball, basketball guy. Uh, and we lit we lit every arena from here to Kalamazoo, and and then some, you know. Uh, and it was a lot of a lot of fun. What was the worst building you had to light? Because there's some nightmare buildings back then. Thank God they don't exist anymore. No, there were different. 
there were different. I loved the his like the historicals like Boston Garden, oh. Chicago Stadium, but they didn't have elevators. No, like we 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 would carry stuff up to the catwalk. And again, for like a younger listener, we're talking about, you know, it was Speedatron packs, but they were probably, they had to be 30, 40 pounds a piece. Easy. A head, a head up and down the stairs. And Chicago Stadium, I'll never forget, you're going, you literally, I don't know how many stairs. I was thinner then, by the way, from up and down the stairs, maybe. <laughs> um <laughs> But you were doing were CrossFit, old, Nate, and you didn't even yeah, know it. I, I, we invented CrossFit by carrying packs up yes, and down stairs. You had uh, no a, idea. A crazy story in Chicago Stadium. You'd hear these noises. We'd be there at you know eleven o'clock in the morning, ten o'clock in the morning, setting up while they're while the you know building ops people are getting ready. And you'd hear these crazy. You're going up the stairs, and you'd hear this crazy noise. We're like, what is that? What is that? And they would have the empty kegs of beer that the guys were rolling down the stairs. So as we're going up the stairs, carrying these, you know, heavy packs and stuff, the empty kegs of beer were flying around. They were the metal, those old silver kegs empty kegs of beer ricocheting off the walls and we're trying to navigate not to get knocked out by those flying down the stairs but then the crazy thing too so they all of that comes down and then they had these workers carrying 2k one on each shoulder going up up the stairs every game um to to put the kegs up in the old chicago stadium yeah um a, a lot of a lot of crazy stories that the organ the pipes of the organ would be up in the catwalk and then they'd test the organ and it would be like oh my god and like be happy not to have a heart attack uh by going by by uh you know being startled and falling off the catwalk um a lot of good a lot of good hard work a lot of good laughs we had yeah i mean that's those are the great characteristics of those buildings that people don't see anymore that like that's how they move the kegs around and i remember going right. there and like it was like going to finway like i wanted to see the keg ramps because right. everybody had talked about it but then they didn't tell me that the rats were the size of cats and yeah. that wasn't a yeah. keg coming down that was a rat like it was yeah, no, a little a little freaky post game uh, when the crowd leaves and there's popcorn and half-eaten uh, brats and hot dogs, and all of a sudden you see a hot dog move by itself, and you're like, "Wait a second, that didn't just get up and run. There was a creature that was having uh, having dinner." You know, yeah. uh, the, cigar the cigarette smoke was was crazy in some of those arenas right. as well. Yeah. Old Boston, old Boston Garden, like I think you weren't supposed to at the time, but there were people like. You know, Red Armback was smoking on the bench not too many years earlier. Sure. You know, um, and that it actually was very cool for some of the photography. Uh, that that little haze when the strobe hit the haze was kind of cool. Right. Yeah. And, and you know, at Boston Garden, I mean, Mike Goulding talked about this on his podcast that it was like its own greenhouse. They would close up the windows and the finals. He remembers shooting against the Lakers and he's sweating yeah. and he's like just drenched in sweat and the yeah. ceiling no, was dripping. A, there was a famous, yeah, there was a famous picture of, of Andy Bernstein's CBS was the broadcast partner and they put a thermometer right in front of the table and it was 120 degrees. And then Pat Riley was standing, you know, coaching and he just would not, give in he wouldn't take his his jacket off he was still in the three-piece suit 120 degrees it looked like he just got out of the shower you know um and you look back on that stuff and it was i i i wish i wish uh that we had enjoyed the moment a little more we everyone was working too hard but we did have you know a, a lot of uh, a lot of laughs along the way yeah i mean you it's amazing to think what like wilt and bill Russell and like where those guys played at on the floor, the small locker rooms, right? Some didn't have hot water, and you're just thinking like, oh, every... definitely oh. hot water was was a luxury, unheard of luxury. <laughs> yeah, like, and they were playing, and the, there weren't media rooms, like you said, there weren't right. elevators. God knows where you right. used to park. Like right. brutal. 
Yeah. How was even uh, like, how were you even worried at times when you were assisting like the power situation? Like you take that yeah. for no all the, all the time because I was a nervous wreck during, during those, during those games and not shooting. But once we would set the lights up, the photographer would come in, we would do our tests and things. Everyone shooting film, obviously we would take a, a, a test frame with it, with a Polaroid. Um, and you were a nervous wreck in those, in those old buildings because nothing was, nothing was, a hundred percent certainty that it would last the game was a circuit breaker or things like that. You know, you'd have to, you know, I had had to minor in, in, uh, in electrical engineering sometimes with how we, how we did some of the things that we did, you know, um, running cables and cords and, and all kinds of, uh, all kinds of things to make sure that the, you kept the power going. Right. Uh, and to, you had some, I'm sure you dealt with some gruff union guys who just didn't want you messing yeah. around. And no, catwalk. Yeah, no, and that, that, that was a whole world uh, into itself where I learned again from, from the SI guys, how to massage guys. Um, <laughs> they were famous. They were famous in Boston before we were even there. Uh, they wanted us to, you know, to go to the North end to some Italian place for lunch you know, and then I'm like, okay, like it was a union shop. They, they go and, and then I'm like, guys, we, we got to go. Like <laughs> lunch kept going on and ordering more stuff and let's get another more calamari, some more pizza. I'm like, guys, we got to get back, you know? Uh, and that was a whole different world of, of dealing with, you know, the, the they, and they called it in Boston in particular, they were called the bull gang crew. And it was a father son union um, that the guy, those guys had been there for generations that would do, you know, set up the basketball court, strike the court, set up the hockey for Bruins. Mm -hmm. And they, they had it down to an, to a science, you know, Um, but we had to, we had to deal with them. Sure. It's, and as much as that was probably crazy and stressful, it was, it's gotta, you gotta close your eyes and think, man, that was the absolute best because it was yeah. just, it gives you a good story. It layers your life with interesting characters. Right. No. And, and like I said, uh, I have drawn an analogy, you know, like sometimes with the, with the players, when you're in the moment, you have a job to do, you're pretty focused, right? you know, but then you, then it, you need to be removed a little bit and then look back and say, you know, uh, hey, that was a pretty good, that was a pretty good time, you know, and there's that famous, there's my wife reminds me of it all the time to that famous quote about, you know, uh, enjoy the journey, mm-hmm. uh, not just, not just the, uh, not just the end. Uh, I'm not, I'm doing the quote a disservice, but, but it was, you, you get the point. It's like, uh, in, enjoy, enjoy the journey, but you, could, but you do have a pretty, in the meantime, I was the junior kid there. You have a pretty stressful job of making sure everything, uh, is working, uh, appropriately. Right. All right. It's, it's such a blessed time. People have no idea how good it was when, so now you got your couple of years in with the NBA. At what point are they looking at both at you and Andy and going, okay, I think we have something here. Let's, right. let's make it more than just two guys on the East coast kind of doing documentary work. And when do they start? Yeah. To, when do they no, start to that, feel like we're yeah, gonna... it just sort of evolved and it was, it was primarily driven at that point. Then after a couple of years of, of, of doing things that it was, it was driven more on the business side quite frankly, and the demand for material and NBA uh, again was growing internationally, but they were growing. They would sign a new deal with, with Spalding or a, a sponsorship thing. Even the, uh, the, the trading cards were a huge thing. They needed, they needed photos for the trading cards. Like now people collect cards. It's, it's cool. Like my, my kids collect cards. Well, those cards come from somewhere, Somewhere. you know, Uh, they don't just magically appear. uh, And you need pictures of the guy, the 12th guy on the bench, not just Michael Jordan. So when he gets in the game, when the bulls are up 20, 
don't pack the cameras and put the cameras away. We need the, all of those guys are equally as important to put a card set together. Right. So that was driven, that was driven on the business side. And again, there had to be uniformity with the look of things and it couldn't be like a black and white or in those days, uh, people that were not shooting on strobe, the quality was, was poor. Oh yeah. Because- because of the not because of their talent or ability uh but because of the just the physical nature of what the lighting was in the nba arenas in those days and the quality you know? of the film available negative Correct. film back then Brutal. Correct. um so nba started we said hey we have something here um there, if there's nat on the east coast andy in the west coast we need to start expanding things and you know getting a guy in Dallas, getting a guy in Chicago, boom, boom, boom. And it sort of just took off from there. Uh, and then having everybody, you know, centralize where the, where the film is, was originally in New York. And then subsequently uh, in New Jersey, in Secaucus, where you, you know, now the, the game, Oh, let's go to Secaucus for the video review that you see on, on games. Mm-hmm. That's where NBA, that's where NBA entertainment is, is located. Did you slowly feel in those couple of years your photography change? Like, were you were you evolving? Yeah, a hundred percent. Because it's like anything else, um, you have to work at it, and you work at your craft. You know, um, and you know, I worked really hard. Um, I I tell people all the time, like I would go to Madison Square Garden all the time. Um, that was like my, my home away from home. I would, you know, prep, do my thing. I would then go home in, when you lived in New York on MSG, they would replay the game. I would watch, I would watch the game. I was just at, uh, just trying to learn it. I I tell the story I've told it before. It cost me a few relationships over over the years for people like the girls were like, Nat, you are nuts. What are you doing? Um, but it's it's photography is no different than any other uh, career where you have to, you have to work at it. Yeah, you know, and you get better. Hopefully, you get better. Uh, equipment changes. You have to adapt. You know, uh, again, in on one of your other podcasts, what separates the men from the boys is like who could who could focus a six hundred millimeter lens. Right. You know, you were talking about manual focus. Some people that to do that at a football game when it's cold out and your eye is tearing is not easy. You know, uh, basketball, we don't use a 600, but we were using a 400 manual focus lens guys running around like you're 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 in the zone. You're focusing, you're working and trying to develop uh, your craft and get better at your craft. And it takes it takes time. How was your learning curve? Like when you went to, let's say you had a 180 and then a 300 and then you go to a four and all of a sudden, right. even the seven footers start to get really tight in that frame. Right. How right. is that learning curve for you? Because most, you know what? Most, I, yeah, it, I worked hard at it, you know, and again, it was an instant gratification of, hitting display on the back of the camera looking at. So after a game, I would go to, you know, New York had a photo district. I would go down to the photo district, drop off film. You wait two or two hours to get the film back. Um, I would go uh, get a slice of pizza, wait for the film one o'clock in the morning. I'm at the light table in the, in the lab looking at my film, you know, and it, it, it is a it's it's a process you know you don't magically uh, all of a sudden have every frame sharp you know but um you're again we're we're shooting film you're not deleting a bad picture you want when you then when i started getting a, an assignment or something from a sports illustrator and they're looking at your film you want that film to look at 36 frames. You you need 29 of them tack sharp, not five, you right. know, um, and you develop, you know, you develop your, 
style, whatever. Um, but it, it, like, like I said, it's like anything else. It, it requires, it requires work. Yeah. That's see, that's the difference too, is when someone would take your film and throw that down on a light table, they're looking at all 36 and they want to see your thought process. Right. Right. right? So like if right. you up, if I tell you, Hey Nate, can you just upload me your 40 best photos from the game? Now I don't really see the process. I see your highlights, but when you look right. at the film on a table, I could see what you were thinking. Right. No, and it's and that's the ultimate, you know, uh, the, it's in the in the it's in the details. Like the ultimate, it has to be exposed. The film, it has to be exposed correctly. You know, that's the first thing. You can't have motion blur of view panning or doing something with the four hundred just because of the size of the lens. Right. You know, things like that. Um, and then it, you know it it kept it kept evolving. You know, and I was still. You know, even though I was a young shooter, I still would always was looking up to those SI, you know, photogs because I was smart enough to know and learn from them, ask some questions, you know, of of them. I was in that circle, which I was very fortunate to be in. I wasn't viewed as like an outsider kind of thing, you know. Uh, because I maintained those friendships more than anything else, those relationships. Um, and then it, it really clicked for me um, when I was able to afford uh, to buy my first Hasselblad. Yes. Thank you for that segue, because that's, that's the beast. And, and that everything, everything clicked for me then. Uh, we were shooting 35 millimeter uh, slide mm -hmm. near court, down court. Um, Hasselblad's came into play where we would shoot near court with with that, and it just clicked for me. It was almost I don't want to sound it was almost like a kind of a spiritual uh, thing for me, you know, because it, it's a mental thing. You have this. First of all, this beautifully crafted camera in your hands, you know, and it just felt good. Like you held it, it felt good, you know, and it became like a mental thing. You're again, shoot, still shooting on strobes. So the first camera was a CCM where it wasn't motorized. It was a crank. Right. You'd follow, follow focusing. I, I used the 120 lens was a beautiful lens and you're you're just follow focusing like a, a jumper here you crank as you focusing following the ball you know and the film was beautiful the strobe like you could see the the sweat on the guy's face uh, it was just a it was like almost to me like a very spiritual uh thing and and that just that just clicked for me. Right. I mean, I, I love your work. I've admired it for years, but I wish I could still see your slides, those Hasselblad slides, those images, right. like you'll shoot stuff. I'll see your stuff. And I'm like, yeah, what would that look like though on a Hasselblad? Uh, I still, I still, uh, I do the same thing. Uh, we are very fortunate at the NBA for the past I don't know, 20 years, uh, way back, we stole a guy from Time Life um, that was uh, works on, on the back end, and he was he scans our old uh, film mm -hmm. because that in and of itself is a lost art of that, that two and a quarter um, is just a beautiful image, oh. okay? But now no one's going to see that. So you do have to scan that image and try to match as best you can. And we have a guy, Dave Bonilla, that works with us, uh, that he is, he is an old school. Uh, he grew up in the, in the Time Life lab, and we are so fortunate to have him because even like the, the Michael Jordan era that I did was all two and a quarter. All of it, uh, yeah. And it, it – you look and and even if if you are fortunate enough 
to look at a chrome still, you look at that chrome on a light table and it 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 you you get goosebumps with, with how with what it looks like. Yeah. And I know it's hard it's hard for people the old the old heads will know what I'm talking about. Um and it just there's it's something magical. We literally shot Velvia fifty ISO film. Oh. Uh we started with Kodachrome, uh went to Fuji in like um, Walter Yost got me involved with Fuji, like maybe, maybe mid eighties, late eighties. He worked on a project for one of the Olympics, maybe the 88 Olympics or mm-hmm. something Fuji. And he would kick me a couple of roles and I would just, it was like the most beautiful uh, film I had ever seen. Oh, um, stunning. And yeah, it just, it just clicked, you know, and I held on to, I held on to shooting film as long as as long as I could. Yeah, uh, we all. So did. I, uh, yeah, I shot until 2004 was when I sort of we were forced to right uh, sort of go to digital because of what the world had become and what people's needs are. You're not going. You're not shooting film. You're not going to the lab for two hours. You're not then scanning it like things things change. It's you know? funny. I remember having a conversation uh-huh. with you in LA during the Lakers Nets finals. I think that's the right. O two or like, O three or whatever. And yeah. you were still filming. You're like, no, no, no. I, they're going to have to make me gonna, by gun force me. Yeah. Like it was still, yeah. and it wasn't really ready yet, but like you said, the needs outweighed the, the quality. Correct. No. And, and I, the first, the first digital stuff was this huge, it was actually a Kodak yes. camera, uh, seven sixty. It's a big, huge, cumbersome computer, and <laughs> like uh, a three meg file or something. And it looked her. It was horrible compared to what you know now on your phone. You get a you get a significantly better file than than those original cameras. Oh yeah, uh, but you know there. I held on as long I did. I did LeBron's rookie year, 2003, all in film, and then segued into into the digital world. And there's pros, pro, pros and cons, obviously. Sure. Uh, you know, um, but now the the digital has it's a it's a different. You know, obviously, I still work with NBA. Our camera, every camera we have is tethered. I hit the button. It goes to Secaucus in two seconds. They have 60 million followers on Instagram. Like the world, going back to SI, I was fortunate enough to get a couple of covers of SI. That was a, a big feather in your cap, you know, a proud moment for any of us photographers. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think Sports Illustrated was like two and a half million people, maybe three million people had subscriptions then. Right. So now you fast forward, you know, 25 years. And like I said, NBA Instagram is is 60 million people that get the, get the images, you know, literally in seconds. So it, it's things are have changed considerably. <laughs> <laughs> oh, when when those late 80s are evolving for you gears changing films changing you got a Hasselblad in your hand how is business for you changing are you thinking I'm gonna stay with the NBA were you ever looking outside and going god I'd love to do football or hockey or maybe no, I it's be- a great great question because with my background with SI I did enjoy doing those other sports you know uh i worked with manny milan a lot for basketball we became very good friends he was doing mike tyson it covered literally mike tyson from when he was 12 years old up until you know his his, all of his uh championships and boxing was fun it's challenging you know the the other sport i love tennis you know shooting tennis was great um but it's something that just sort of evolved because I was always sensitive about as a photographer, you have to have confidence in your ability, Mm -hmm. you know? So you say, 
I don't want to be known as just a basketball shooter. Right. You know, it's nice. Okay. I appreciate everyone thinking you're good at basketball. That's a nice comment, but yeah, I could shoot football. I could shoot like that's, that's what drives all of us. Mm -hmm. You know, it may or may not be true, but you know, I like, I like the, the challenge of doing different things, you know, um, but it sort of segued for me personally, the growth of the NBA. It was exciting to be around. Um, I was also uh, knowing that being a, a, a freelancer and the phone rings and you got to go. I had young kids uh, at home, late 80s, early 90s, and you can never say no. Right, you know? no. You so gotta, it's, it's go, the, not no. Yeah, and and it it all photographers know that it's a tough thing on uh, on your family life because even under the best of circumstances, you're working nights, weekends, and holidays, yeah. right? Yeah. So that's when the games are. So the NBA, the the one of the good things on a just a personal life note was most times I knew my schedule in advance. Sure. <laughs> NBA schedule comes out. Oh, this Knicks game. Now you're going to do this, this, and this. There's always something that comes up last minute. Right. But it was not like a total, you know, freelance world where you get a call on a Saturday and have to be in Minnesota Sunday when you had plans to to watch my son's uh, game or something, you know, on a personal life side. Right. Uh, so that – that sort of I I loved what I'm doing uh, during that time period, and that combined with you know life and family and you know kids, uh, that sort of just just worked for me, you know. Right. Uh, and and then you know then as we all know, then you blink and five more years go by. Right. You know. And see, that's the um, thing. You were there in the hurricane. Right. Like right. it's, it's right. evolving so quickly. Those eighties are unbelievable. And then there's like these landmark things that are starting to happen in the nineties. And it's like, boom, rocket ship. Yeah. NBA yeah. No, explodes and, Jordan. Yeah. Poof, it's just right. And, and it's the, and, and what it was, the culmination of that uh, was the 92 uh, dream team, the right. Olympics. Yeah. I mean, and, and that was, that was, and again, that was the, you know, you, we look back on that time. It was like, you know, being with the Beatles, right? <laughs> you know, we're 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 in Barcelona with that team, and did that um, seem crazy to you? Like, can you think? Can you yeah. close your eyes now and go, "Wow, who? I can't believe that happened." Yes, yeah, um, and 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 now, you know, as crazy as that is, that's ninety two was thirty years ago. That spawned the whole that international growth of of basketball. Yeah, that was you know, that was a there, genesis. There's a, whole, there's a whole gener there's a whole generation now. The kids. Well, my father, my father would talk about you know watching that dream team. You know, forgetting about the the players that you know the Petrovics mm -hmm. and Tony Kuko you know, and yeah. all of those guys. You know, they then came over to the NBA. But that was the you know when you, when you look back on it. It, it was, you know, soccer uh, was was the world's sport. But you can you can now you know argue that basketball is is it's like a one in one a that basketball is right up there on a, the popularity worldwide, uh, and that was the that was the start of it for sure. Right. Was that that ninety two dream team? Not to name drop, but I was talking to Magic one time, and he said it's very fortunate that that. 92 was in Barcelona and not 96 in Atlanta because them being in Europe was even better. Like it just, it exposed them to you know, the whole good continent. Point, but sure. Sure. Because that, um, yeah. And it, I hadn't I thought it of it until he said totally, that. No, because at the time there was even criticism of why are the professionals playing against amateurs? Mm -hmm. Right. And if, if that was in the U S U S crowd of course they're supposed to win like it would have been downplayed you know considerably right but the fact that it was in in barcelona 
uh, would would be a worldwide, much more of a worldwide stage, right? For sure. Yeah, he had you said know? that, and I was like, I never thought of that that way. Like you guys were playing right. in a like in a place that seeded all these unbelievable European players, right? No, and I, there was such vivid memories of that, uh, and it, I tried to get a still, and I I never I never got it. But on a video, I'm sure it's on YouTube or something. If if you were to the opening tip of the game of any game, not just the game, any game, the ref throws the ball up, flashes across everywhere yeah. uh, in the arena. We're not talking about iPhones. In 1992, it's the little the little cameras that everyone had. Yeah, little point. And there shoots. you go. There you go. Yeah, uh, it's so. It's so remarkable. And I tried to do like a slow shutter to get the, all the pops. And I never, I never got, uh, I got a decent one, never got the one. Um, right. That's yeah. Uh, but the crazy, like people talk about, you know, the memories, it was fun. We, we were all in the same hotel. We were all hanging out together. It was like summer camp, but one of the craziest, one of the craziest memories from that game was, Guys on the on and I forget the team, but the guys on the bench that weren't in the game for one of these European teams had cameras on the bench. So Magic Johnson is backing his man down, and the guys got guarding him. He's he, he's doing this, and he's going to his his teammates on his bench. Now, 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 take the picture of him guarding Magic Johnson. They had cameras on the bench and they're taking pictures. And it just goes to show the significance of, of the moment, you know? Yeah. And those, those stories like that uh, are, are, are so important to me because that the fandom and the timing of, of all of that, you know? Right. Yeah. Um, the opposing guys coming up, they wanted the wristband, they wanted the sneaker, they wanted the shirt. Like the guys were just the opposing Olympians were just in such awe of the of the U.S. team. Well, see, you said it's like traveling with the Beatles. I think it's almost like if the Beatles, Zeppelin, the Who, and and they let Jim they let Jimi Hendrix come in and play. It was like right. that kind of unbelievable. Right. Yeah. No, the bus rides to the arena. Um, they had, we had a police escort. It was like a crazy scene. There was one time we had, there were helicopters above the bus and the helicopter would swoop down. There was a police officer in the helicopter, hanging out of the helicopter, hitting cars with a stick, the roof of the car to clear a path for the, you know, for the, um, for the buses to go through. You Do you know? have a shot of that? Uh, yes. Oh yeah. My God. Um, See, and that's it's just cool stuff, yeah. you know. Like I've got Michael Jordan dunking, big deal. But it's right. that shot, you know, where it's like you. I can't. I have to show you a picture to explain this craziness because I, I, right. nothing else will actually make it into your head to understand. Yeah. The yeah. circus. No, exactly. Yeah. No, no, and the probably you know the the walk from the hotel to the bus, the twenty five foot walk three or 4,000 fans outside the hotel every, every day, you know, that, that kind of, that kind of thing. Uh, it was just fun, uh, fun times. Were, were you, what was your process uh, starting to like evolve where you felt like, okay, when I go to a game, I need to get this, not with the NBA kind of giving you instruction, but okay. Nat needs to get, a, B, C, D, E, and then I feel like I've accomplished a great basketball game. Right. You know what? I was always about, with the, my background of the SI stuff again, like I was always liked the peak action stuff, you know, initially. That was, you know, whether it's just, you know, not necessarily, we all want the game winning shot, but I want, I want, again, the act like, the ball on the fingertips as someone is shooting a jumper mm -hmm. or, you know, the facial expression, the intensity, the, you know, the drama of the sport kind of mm -hmm. thing, you know, uh, that was always my initial focus. Then you can get into the different matchups, you know, this guy against 
that guy kind of thing. You know, the game within a game, maybe right. for like, you know, that type of stuff. Again, we're not we we were not shooting for a newspaper where they already had a story written and wanted you know to to fill a photo, right. you know, right. from, from that. So so it was always a little bit different. Um, but then learning like like anything else, I said earlier, you'd learn your craft like. Uh, developing, I wanted to tell a little bit of a story or something about that particular game, you mm. know? Uh, and sometimes the games are bad, right. like for me. And and that, like like Andy Bernstein and I, we have like a, you know, a, a friendly rivalry. Uh, he's been in LA and I'm in New York. I'm like, dude, you shot Kareem, Worthy, Magic, Kobe, uh, now, now LeBron and oh yeah, the Clippers had Chris Paul, Blake Griffin, but go down the list, you know, and you know, not to dog some of my <laughs> Nick compadres, but Patrick Ewing retired 25 years ago or something like what's been going on. Like it does make a difference. Sure. I'm not posing, I'm not posing these guys, you know? So uh, sometimes stuff isn't there, you know. The cool thing for me over the years was a lot of the, you know, players had respect for Madison Square Garden, like Madison Square Garden being the mecca. Mm -hmm. The old school players, whether it were obviously Michael is was Michael, uh, but they they would want to put on a show at the Garden, right? Almost regardless, regardless of who was on the Knicks team, they had. They had maybe they played there once in college, or but they understood uh, the importance and significance of having a good game at Madison Square Garden. It meant that something, helped. yeah, that, yeah. That helped me. But overall, you know, so, you know, basketball is a star-driven league. There has not been as much of the sexiness of late, um, you know, with the Knicks in particular. Um, hopefully that changes i'm ready right you know it's funny like we had glimmers we had glimmers of that in brooklyn i don't know i don't know what's going on in in brooklyn now uh <laughs> i didn't want to bring I, it up <laughs> a sore a sore topic i love Kyrie. i love kd like it it makes going to work more fun it's as simple as that yeah you're in a you little know? bit of soap opera i i, I shoot last year i like had beautiful images of of Durant during warmups. If it wasn't Durant, I wouldn't have even been shooting. Right. But just him, his presence, his his aura, you know, I do some things playing around in warmups with different lighting and things that I'm not able to do during the game. Like it's it's it makes going to work fun when you have the sexiness of those big stars. Kyrie and I have uh, and I, I like him. We're we're pretty friendly actually. And I said, dude, sometimes you make me want to shoot video. And I don't, never say that to anyone because well, he do something crazy. And on a still, it doesn't translate. Right. Well, he's known for his sick handle and stuff and the way he finishes. Like Magic Johnson wasn't that way. Magic would do a no-look pass. You want the ball on his fingertips. I never even thought about shooting video or something, you know. Right. Uh, be, but um, just something about the way that the Kyrie's handles are sometimes a still image doesn't do it justice with how, you know, talented he is. Yeah. I mean, you can make it look awkward and you're like, no, what he did was unbelievable. It went this way. Right. And you're like, yeah, yeah. I, I don't see it. <laughs> like, trust me, that's what happened. <laughs> right. Right. Ex exactly. Um, so, yeah. I mean, for, for a still guy to say, I would have loved to have shot that in video of you. That that means something. That means that that, that player is doing something special. Yeah, and and he is a very where him in particular is a very very uh, creative cerebral guy, and he knew exactly what I meant. Mm -hmm. you know? uh, and he goes, "No, I appreciate that." Like he knew he knew exactly uh, what the you were referring for to. Yeah, 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 exactly. Um, but hopefully he's hopefully he's he's in Brooklyn next year. Right? <laughs> that would make your life easier. When yeah. did when did remotes become a part of your routine in the NBA and shooting? Right. Um, you know what? It's another great question. Like 
again with my the marriage that I I had with with uh, Sports Illustrated, uh, and then I forget I'm bad with my years, but there was uh, when when the, the this guy approached me uh, who had this product. It's called the Flash Wizard. Oh yes, uh, I had I had one foot in SI, one foot in the NBA, and or like what are you talking about? And, and basically it's this device that you could sync cameras together. Uh, and syncing cameras together was not a new concept per se, but syncing it together to then sync with the same flash. This was, this was a totally new concept because typically uh, prior to that, you could sync a camera, you could set up three or four remotes, but you had to determine one of them would stink with the, with the flash, not mm-hmm. all of them. Right. Um, so that was intriguing to me. They were based out of uh, Burlington, Vermont. Yeah. We spent time, we spent time uh, up there uh, doing a lot of R and D developing those, those units and I thought it would be cool. What I had in my head was to do uh, like an NBA, the slam dunk contest or something where you get, again, with the strobe, you get one frame, but getting one frame from five or six angles mm-hmm. would be sick. You picture Michael Jordan from the foul line. Okay. Well, then getting that has never been done before. Getting that from different angles all, right. at, the, all at the same moment. Uh, a crazy amount of R and D trial and error. We were using Hasselblads, um, got it to work. Um, editors and people liked it. Uh, unfortunately for us, they then expected it to be done every game. And I'm like, Whoa, wait a minute. I didn't, <laughs> I didn't plan on doing this every game because the, it just, the, the amount of, of, of labor, involved is is kind of uh and was kind of nutty oh god um, yeah oh getting and and again you know for for some of the listeners like uh nba game starts at 7 or seven thirty. we would get there to deal with strobes like have lunch and be there at 12 o'clock one o'clock for a seven o'clock game well then adding in remotes then you're talking about getting to a game at 10 in the morning to set up remotes, then do lighting, then do testing. And it, it's kind of, uh, it's kind of insane. You're talking about, you know, a 14 hour day of, of setting things up for a two and a half hour event, right. you know, but. And then the math. Uh, okay. More cameras, more lenses, more film. Like it just all started right. to add up. Right. And then, then, yeah. And it starts with then the schlepping through the airport with, you're talking about, you know, typically we had eight or nine cases of lighting equipment. Then now you're adding in five or six more cases of camera equipment, you know, uh, and things like that. It was, it was pretty insane, you know, uh, but all it takes is that one, <laughs> we're all psychos, that one image that you get and it's like, oh, wow, that's beautiful, you know getting it from from different angles um and now it is surprising how rare you get one image that looks great from five angles say very rare you know there's an ancillary player there's a referee there's this there's that you know um the 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 camera behind the glass um looks great but the one on the floor maybe got blocked or something or no faces of the overhead Uh, whatever Correct. Correct. Overhead. Yeah. Overhead. Again, when you're talking about strobes, like overhead doesn't look good typically on a shot and overhead would look good for a rebound Mm -hmm. when they're looking up for the the ball, you know? And again, um, it was just fun to, to be involved with. Uh, It did become sort of uh, a little bit of the standard operating procedure using these, these units and we started out with film uh using the units and uh you know having a camera on the glass you get 24 frames for an entire game right you're not bringing a ladder out at a timeout you're not changing it at a quarter you have 24 frames 
Um, could you get away with? Game. Could you get away trying to change it at halftime, or no way in hell? Depends on the arena, and in particular, Chicago Stadium. No, no, Chicago you know, is tight. So, as so then truck. I'm shooting the game, and you know, um, one of the things that we put into the unit was you could, you could, we call it scanning. You could scan and then find out how many frames right. you had left. Oh, that was a godsend. Uh, which, which was which was cool because the guys were very uh, friendly to what the photographers' needs are when they were developing everything, but. So I'm sitting there and it's the third quarter. I have 11 frames left. Scotty Pippen goes flying in for a dunk. Do I shoot? Do I shoot it on Scotty Pippen or wait for Michael? <laughs> and by the way, we all know in a live event, the second you start over, it's over. No, like you're you done. Miss, you miss the sh- so then like the talk about like the, the psyche of what goes into shooting. There is a, a huge mental component. Like, so literally I'm looking at the score. If Chicago is blowing somebody out, chances are Michael could sit out the fourth quarter, right? Mm -hmm. Or he could play half the fourth quarter, you know? So this all comes into play with how I'm shooting those remotes. It doesn't like handheld is different. I'm changing backs, you know, during a timeout or, you know, something, uh, a quarter break, but literally trying to figure out uh, when uh, to shoot the, 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 the remote because you have 24 frames for, for the entire game. Yeah, once, uh, once you start hearing that voice in your head, you're over. It's, you've taken yourself away from your focus. Right, right. And then um, you're done. Yeah. <laughs> then, yeah you're, no, then you're uh, talking to yourself on the baseline. Nate, don't yeah. shoot now. And everybody's looking at you like, what's wrong? Crazy, no, a hundred percent. And, and the good ending to that particular story is my last year of shooting film um, was 2003. I wanted to get LeBron's rookie year okay. uh, in, uh, in film. I have a sick LeBron James dunk at the garden. He was on the Cavs. And it was frame 24. Oh. And I was, I, my, my MJ training, um, <laughs> crazy, crazy young baby face LeBron from like four different angles. Uh, and it was, it was the last, uh, the last frame on the, on the roll. Uh, if, if, uh, if I did not have that, it would be a lot of, a lot of sleepless nights, uh-huh. you know? Yeah. And those happen too. And then that goes back to like someone doesn't clip the film right or someone doesn't read it. And you said plus one and a quarter and they did it at oh, hundred. Yeah. They did it a half. I mean, yep. no, I used to take copious notes from arena to arena because I would want to avoid having to do a clip test because theoretically you could get an extra two frames. Right. So if I'm in Chicago Stadium in November, we're setting the lights up. I'm using my light meter. And, okay, then I go back in February. It's the same light. You know what? I'm not going to – it is a different type of risk. I'm not going to do a clip test, Right. you know, for for the film. Uh, I'm just going to run it at, based on my notes from, you know, November or whatever. Yeah. Um, and it's it's funny. And I do have – I do have a crazy collection. Uh, some people, my wife might say it, I'm a little bit of a hoarder with weird things. I have a, I have a, um, a shoe box full of clip tests. Really? From, yeah. Um, I saved uh, the stuff that was cool, even from a portrait. Um, like prior to the 92 Olympics, we did a lot of marketing with, with all the guys like MJ in his Olympic uniform, drinking a Gatorade. And I have like a clip test with the notes, written, like stuff like that. It's just cool to right. me. You yeah. know? Um, and I, I have, uh, you know, a lot of people have saved Polaroids over the years. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, I have, have saved some Polaroids, but I, I do have a, a, a shoe box full of uh, old clip tests that are that are pretty cool. Do you remember if you loaded, if you kind of went kind of cheap on the loading the film, you can get 36 frames. Like if you didn't take the tongue all the way over, but if you had it yeah. hook 
just a little bit, yeah. you can get 36. I've yeah. always wanted to do a book called 37. And then it's just <laughs> all of my frames that I got right. one extra on. <laughs> right, right. That's awesome. Even no, if it was nothing. Cra- yeah, it's the crazy, it's the crazy things about like, you know, we do our due diligence, but but there's a little bit of of craziness and things out of our control that happen. Yeah. You know, you know um, uh, okay. Because you've started and you understand lighting. Were there ever games where you had that nightmare where you lost the light or, you know, things went bad for you and there's just, you sit there and go, okay, I'm going to make the best of it. I don't have lights down court. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, thankfully um, it hasn't happened a lot um, because again, uh, uh, the mental component of not shooting too quickly or something, but that could happen. You get a little uh, excited and you, you right. shoot, you know, faster uh, or you just pop a breaker in a building. Like we talked about earlier, it does, it does happen, yeah. you know? Uh, and then, you know, with, with the film, you, you sort of mentally have to then calculate your, <laughs> exposure and things, you know, and hope that you weren't, you weren't too far off, you know, because if you're mid, like if it happened on the remotes, like you have to, you can't adjust the cameras, you know, but if it happens on your handheld, you, so you open up a half a stop or a stop or something, you know, on the, on the camera. Um, And I, I like that part of thing. I like the, the more cerebral aspect of, of those things. You know? How how are the '90s for you as your career now? Like, right, you got the Bulls; they're just exploding. Um, were you feeling like you got your ten thousand hours in, and you were like starting to become a master of craft? Yeah, but you never get like I never get too. You're comfortable, but not cocky. Uh-huh. If right. that, you know, like they were crazy, like those '90s Bulls Knicks series, right? Were were true battles. That was that's know? boxing. Yeah. You were in a physical yeah. battle, hundred percent. And uh, again, you're in the moment, uh, and I I loved it. You know, and you don't want to. You just can't miss something. You know, um, and there's a lot of pressure. You know, so you have to be comfortable, Mm -hmm. but you can't, you know, you can't miss things. And it like, thankfully, uh, you know, I haven't, uh, I haven't missed too many things, right? you know, uh, my biggest miss, everyone has them. My biggest miss was the 2000 Olympics was Vince Carter when he jumped over oh, yeah. uh, Frederick Weiss. And it's a crazy, like, story. Um, Olympics, we shoot, like, three or four games a day. You're bleary-eyed. We're doing men's, women's, whatever, you know. Um, and I put the camera down. It was at the opposite end of the court. I would feel worse if it was um, if it was on my near court, right. you know. But it was at the opposite end of the courts. And in those days, there was no, um, you know, they didn't like remotes at the Olympics and mm-hmm. stuff. They have different rules and things. I literally uh, was exhausted, put the camera down, my down court camera down for five seconds. And Vince Carter jumped over, like everyone knows the pick. He jumped over Frederick Weiss, one of the craziest in-game dunks ever. You know, right. um, and it's a cool story. There was a Getty photographer. I'm drawing a blank on his name, but it was his first basketball game he ever shot. <laughs> got that, got that picture. Sick, sick picture of, you know, Vince going up and over. So it just goes to show like right place, right time being prepared. Right. You know, I literally, literally, hundreds of of or uh, games shot during the olympics between men women all the other teams i and i put the camera down for five seconds that's uh, all and, it takes and, you know that again hey can you do that again you know it, it doesn't work that way 
you know. And, and, uh, and that wasn't Muggsy Bogues size player. That was a full size grown ass man. He was he was a seven he was a seven footer. Yeah. Uh, and he literally jumped um, over. Jumped over. Him. <laughs> God. Uh, so yeah. What, pretty pretty awesome. What's it been like working in? You touched a little bit, but working in Madison Square Garden, it being your home away from home. What has that been like? You know what? It's been a, a true blessing, to be honest, because you know while I've said that the Knicks uh, lately have not been you know one of one of the best NBA teams, there is something magical about the building. You know, uh, there just is like. Elton John says it's his favorite uh, building to perform in. You know, Mm -hmm. it it transcends uh, certain things. The I have tweaked over the years the lighting with the strobes in the garden that I I I really love how things look. What have you done? It has a little little bit of a uh, the way people are familiar with that ceiling, right? You know, so it's not like it's not your typical north south catwalk yeah it's circular, you know, so there right? different, it's circular so there are different uh bays mm-hmm. uh that the lights are in so it can be a little bit more directional because it's it's goboed a little bit by the structure of the of the building right uh so i think like when i'm shooting down court there there are spots where the background goes totally black oh. so it has kind of like a like almost like a Broadway stage kind of look to mm-hmm. it that I, I think is, is very cool. It, and it has an, almost like a little bit of a, of a 3d look to mm-hmm. it, you know? Uh, but there's just something magical about the building. The crowd is nuts, you know? Um, and like I said earlier to the, the, the opponents um, have respect for, you know, the garden being the Mecca. Right. Um, and that, I've been, I've been very fortunate to, uh, to shoot a lot of games there yeah. over the year. I mean, Ooh. a lot of people have come through there and you must have seen some unbelievable performances. Yeah. Even like, like, a like a Kobe, for example, they only come in once a year, right? The Lakers play once a year. So that, that Lakers come in, that gets circled on my calendar right off the bat, you sure. know? Uh, and things like that. So I need to be ready. Uh, but those, you know, people of that magnitude, they understand the significance of that. LeBron now comes into the garden as a Laker. Uh, I'm going to have that one circle, different things like that. You know, those, that's a big, that's a big deal. Yeah, no, absolutely. How, how have you developed over your years, like relationships with players? Because, when you first started, nobody gave a rat's ass about what they wore to the game, right? Like you, you weren't out there in the tunnels shooting people's well, clothes. And- there's a there's a great story for that too, because it's the one not a miss, but the one you you don't take. Larry Bird was famous for he just didn't like his picture getting taken. Like he's not into it. Like yeah. I respect it. Tim Duncan was that way, you know, but there was a moment of Larry Bird walking up the old Boston garden had these crazy, like wood, I don't know, like 12 by 12 uh, wood things going up. And, and he was walking up with a basketball under his arm it would be like the craziest, like arrival type shot ever, even from the back, it would have been cool, you know? Um, but I didn't, I didn't, wasn't ready. I wouldn't have shot it anyway. Cause he knew like, I didn't ever want to piss off Larry Bird, sure. you know, but it was just a cool moment. And then you fast forward now again, you know, in the advent of social media and player branding this and that, you know, these, these walk-in uh, tunnel shots that they're referred to as are the biggest deal ever with the guys, with what they're wearing, uh, what, you know, sneakers, it's, it's driven right. a lot by, by the shoe companies, but it, it transcends that like jacket, clothes, watch, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's pretty, it's pretty nuts. Uh, and again, it's a little, it has added a little more to our workload. It used to be like, we go early, set up, chill, maybe have some bad press room food somewhere, you know, but now, 
we're tasked with, you know, uh, if it's a seven o'clock game, anywhere from from four o'clock on, we're tasked with shooting uh, the guys walking into the arena. Yeah, you know. See, that's another um, thing people don't get. Like that, you might be doing your last final tests at four thirty, four forty five, focusing right. the remotes. Dial- no, now you got to be standing there and waiting for a bus to pull up and shoot um, some guy. Yeah, and and it is it is kind of it is kind of nutty because the one if you were to miss someone, that would be the one time they're wearing some crazy right. outfit. They ask they ask for the you know they ask for the picture. They walk by me. And they're 10 feet, you know, they're texting me, bro, when can I get the picture? I was like, really? You know, we just, we just like, can you focus on the game? Uh, but they're like, they're all like uh, 20 somethings who, uh, who want to, you know, post it to uh, the gram, make, Nate, post it. You know, to- <laughs> um, and it's, it's kind of, you know, different arenas now have different, you know, footprints where they walk in, you know, Phoenix has a long walk. And the photographer there does like different lighting and stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, the guy there, Barry, and it's it's actually pretty cool because then the players get into it. There's a long walkway. Right. Some some teams have sponsorships now. You know, of course, uh, God forbid. Jet, right? jet Jet Blue Runway. I think the Celtics are Jet Blue. The Nets have this company Goat that is a sneaker driven um, company. Mm-hmm. You know. Uh, so it, it's kind of that has taken on a, a life of its own, you know, and added and added 90 minutes to, to our uh, to our workday. While has, we're waiting for uh, buses and stuff to come. Has that helped with build relationships with the players? You know, it, it has, uh, to be honest, because uh, most of the you you get a sense some of the guys aren't into it. Right. So you just. Like I'm not ever going to deliberately piss somebody off. Like oh, whatever, why? like someone, if they're not into it, they're not into it. You know, certain guys are not into it. Certain guys are very into it, but it has, um, it has helped, I think with those relationships because it just starts a little bit of dialogue about, you know, um, you know, they, they appreciate that you're there. They, they want to look good. So you, you're there to, you know, in that instance, you're, you're there, you know, as sort of a, you know, a relationship uh, component to just help them out. Right. You know, I mean, by nature, you're, you're a voyeur, right? you you look, you take pictures through the camera. Has that kind of been interesting that like they, they're aware of you like, Oh, Hey, there's Nate. Hey, take my yeah. picture. Get no, and I think, yeah. And I think that has helped me, um, uh, obviously, I've been doing this a long time, and one of the one of the older guys, you know, might pull the the younger guys. Hey, that's Nat. He he's the one that took that shot, and they're like, "Oh, cool," you know, yeah. like that kind of. Even back to the MJ days, like he always he always knew what we were doing. There was the video crew that was doing Last Dance. Mm-hmm. Like I was piggybacking with them most of the time. Like if you are cool with. MJ, the rest of the locker room is going to be fine right. with you. That kind of thing. I'm not going to, I'm not there uh, to paint someone in a bad light or something, oh, yeah. you know? And I almost, uh, I almost overthink things in the, in that, in the locker room area is, is there, is there place? Right. You know what I mean? I love to document that type of stuff. Like, LeBron sitting there with his with his feet in the bucket in the ice after the game. I love those types of of images to tell the story. You're getting a massage, getting stretched out, but you just sort of that's where you use your expertise. It does help knowing the guys, obviously, but you never like you don't go in there with the flash, bang, 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 bang. Like you go in there, you pick your spots now that's an area where digital has helped to be honest. You have a silent shutter. You don't use a flash. So bump up the ISO to 5,000 or something and not use a flash. You're less obtrusive, you know? So again, using your head to think about the situation and stuff, um, because I still love those types of moments and those images typically do get a great response 
oh, from the fan yeah. stuff because the fans want to know that these guys they want to see those shots. Yeah. You know, the football locker room, NBA locker rooms are still relatively small. A football locker room, obviously, they have sixty players on a roster. But the guy after a game in his pads, the helmet down by his feet, just totally exhausted, icing your elbow, do, like those kinds of images conjure like you can feel them. They have they have some emotion. Oh, absolutely. Have you have you enjoyed the portraiture work in your career as it's moved forward? Because you weren't yeah. doing a lot and now you know um, you, you started to you do know, it. I, I I I love it. Um it has because like everything else during the like COVID era, yeah, uh, we haven't done a lot of that, but I, I really enjoy that. And I try, it doesn't come like naturally as naturally as the games, just because of the, you talk about the 10,000 hour thing, you know? Um, so I, I enjoy it. I like pre thinking, a. uh, the process, thinking about what I want to do, doing a lighting test, you know, that type of thing, because we all know you don't get much time, no. you know, no. uh, I have literally, uh, taken, taken portraits over the years, press the button four or five times. That's it. You have five images to choose from. You don't want to blink. You don't want to yawn, you know? Um, so we don't get, we, we don't not get uh, a lot of time with, with, with them. Uh, but I, I enjoy it, and it shows a different side of them. And I like to, you know, I like to do that uh, for my own growth and creativity. Sure, right, yeah. I mean, us as creators, that's certainly a part of something you want to actually spend some time and work on because it shows a right. different avenue you get a chance to create where in a basketball game you're just trying to capture things and whatever creating you could do is very right. limited no and it, yeah and it is the one time where you could you know say hey can you look this way turn this way like you know um because you don't obviously during during a live event you're not you're not doing that you know um and i i enjoy i do enjoy uh i enjoy that a lot as the years have gone on i mean this is some things i think photographers forget is their health and taking care of themselves. It's funny. We're around elite athletes. And like you talked about, we joked, like we probably invented CrossFit carrying speedos up flights of stairs and stuff. Yep. Like, do you, is that something you're more aware about as you get older in your age, like take care of yourself and not eat? Bad? You know, it's a, yeah. It's a great question. Um, and it is something we all, uh, need to be aware of. Um, and, you know, I joked earlier about a bad press room uh, dinner or right. something. Well, you can't have that be the excuse. That's our world, and that's been my world for we're, we're coming up. It's it's going to be forty years soon. Like so, that's that that's not an excuse. You know, you know that you have to. You know, I I leave my house at eleven thirty in the morning to go to a seven thirty game. I get home at midnight. You know, so I pack a little bit of you know some nuts i have to make sure that i drinking water and just silly things that like when you're 25 years old you don't you don't care you don't think of that right you know uh but thankfully i feel i feel good uh reasonably healthy um we're sitting in a pretzel position on the baseline like that's not it's not easy you right. know night after night i can't tell you how many of my contemporaries it's the knee replacement hip replacement like go down the list from football guys kneeling uh for football season year after year after year so it does uh, it does take its toll physically right. there's no there's no doubt about that and i don't want that to be the the reason why you have to stop you know yeah. i want to stop on my my terms not you know uh, not because I, I, my hip is bothering me or right. something. Yeah. And, and that's something people don't remember or think about is that you're sitting on wood, right? You, I'm sure you have a chair, but you're sitting on wood that's under ice. Like right. it's not the most comfortable place to be for two and a half hours. No. And even the, the chairs are more of a prop because NBA is very diligent about player safety, Right, you know, so there's literally these chairs are like these little collapsible. There's no metal allowed in the chair kind of thing. Anymore, so it's yeah. a, it, help, 
it helps a little with back support. Um, but, but it is something that I do, uh, I do take more of an, uh, effort, uh, in the off season, uh, to, you know, keep, keep my weight down, do some stretching, do some different things. Um, because it, it's, you need to, you have to. Yeah. I didn't, I, I literally never thought about it to my mom once said, and it's kind of silly that your mother has to remind you this, but I'm assisting McDonough. And she said to me, are you taking care of John? And I was like, what do you, what do you mean? He's a grown, grown ass man. And she's like, well, he's working very hard. You should make sure he has water. I was just like, yeah. Oh, I didn't think about it. Like John was, this is in the late early nineties. He didn't stop. And I was like, and this was pre bottled water. So I was like, yeah, maybe I should go get him something. And you know, you don't think about it when you're young, you just go, 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 go. Oh, a hundred, a hundred percent. And for, for me personally with the COVID stuff, once we went to the arena, we weren't allowed to leave. There was no, in the, in the height of stuff, or when the games started, there were no concession stands. Right, there's you nobody know. there. Sure. So I would bring a bring a little something, you know, uh, and I and had a thermos of, uh, you know, bringing some soup or something. Like you, you need something. I'm not, I'm not going to Madison Square Garden fifty or sixty times a year. I'm not having like fried chicken fingers. They're delicious, by the way, with a little honey mustard. Delicious. Once a month, man. I can't have you know, like you. Know, but seriously, you can't. You can't do that, right? You know, uh, and that goes for all of us, the writers, the photographers. Like, it, and it, it is a it is a, a discipline that, as we get older, you you have to be more conscious of that. Yeah, I, I don't think people think about that. Like the amount of like stress you go through in a game and if you don't have fuel in your belly like right. you're not gonna yeah. make no. it yeah and the w- simple is that the water is the most simple like you said you're not in an office you go to the water cooler right like, we don't have that we don't have that luxury you're yeah. there for 10 12 hours you have to you have to you know be be disciplined and diligent i guess is the is the right yeah the right phrase nobody has ever brought me water in a 20 second timeout not once in my career, someone. <laughs> right. Have you ever um, taken a real beating in a game? Because you, those Knicks in those early '90s bodies were flying. Have you ever gotten a good um, shellacking? You know what? Thankfully, no. I was at the bottom of a couple of scrums, but never got hit. Uh, one of my cameras got destroyed okay. uh, once, uh, and I sent Charles Oakley as a joke. I sent him the invoice just as, as a joke. Of course it was uh, Charles. He, he said, man, what, what are you doing? Man? I was like, dude, you got to be careful. Go to the guy down, down the block from me. Don't, uh, but thankfully, uh, no. And, you know, like I said earlier, NBA is very diligent about, you know, different, different things. And it's always, they're always evaluating uh, things. Uh, I'm thankful that we're, still on the court right uh because those images are dynamic it's as simple as that it's the, that's where you need to be um it's a it's a constant give and take with sometimes the fans the fan pays now three thousand dollars to go to a game and then you're sitting in front of them so they might not be happy about that. So you have to kind of massage that a little bit. Uh, we're yeah, talking who, about. Who sits know, behind you? It, Who's normally sitting behind you? Who's your regular foot massage? <laughs> um, you know what? They, there's a couple of, there's a couple of guys in Brooklyn that I'm, that I'm friend, friendly with. Um, a guy, Brian is a, is a big music guy. He, he owns uh, polo grounds music. Okay. Uh, so you get, you get to know people, right? Yeah. you know, huge, huge hoop fan. So you talk a little bit of hoops, you know, um, and then, you know, obviously everyone knows Spike, mm-hmm. uh, as the Knicks fan, we go, we go way back, Sure. you know, from, from him, me helping him sneak into a couple of games. <laughs> Before he was Spike. Yeah, when he was uh, young Spike. You know, yeah, without yeah. money. Uh, but that's cool. Like, we're all fa- we're fans. I'm a, I'm a fan, yeah. you know. I'm not sitting there cheering. 
uh, but I'm a fan of the game. I love, I love the game. Yeah, no, it's, it's, you've been fortunate. And I know times have been lean and, and whatever, but you are in a place, especially on these coasts, cause you had Philly and you had Boston. You, you've seen some unbelievable basketball in those, in those eras that you've shot it. I mean, great stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah, truly, truly fortunate. And, um, uh, like you get greedy. I want, I want, you know, right. more, more, more. <laughs> oh, it's like, it's, it's just fun for me because I have such respect for the competitive aspect of things, Yeah, you know? Uh, and I do see, I do see the time and I am behind the curtain a little bit with what these guys put in. Mm-hmm. You know, Steph Curry didn't wake up one day and be the best shooter in history. Right. Like the, the time I remember, you know, him where people were wondering if he could play or not. He had bad ankles. Right. Like he, the time, the time that he put in the guy, the time that the guys put into their craft. Uh, I have, I have so much respect for them for that. I, I want to ask you this because I think it's always interesting. They get forgotten, but the wives, your relationship, like how has that been? Like you must have a great wife that understands like you're leaving at 11, you're home at midnight. You got right. y- your schedule. You could see it in September and you know where you're going to go through like June. How is right. that? How has that relationship been? It's yeah, it's not, it's not easy, you know? Um, and for wives, kids, family go right down the line, you know, uh, it's not easy because we work right. nights and weekends first and foremost. Right, you holidays. Know, and you, and holidays that you have worked on Christmas. Christmas, you know, is is a big NBA day. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then you can get into the minutia. Really, why do you leave at eleven thirty for a seven thirty game? That's a whole different yeah. story. When you're talking to your friends, or your friends are getting together on a Sunday to watch football which would be fun. And you're like, ah, oh, I'd love to, I've got a Knicks game. You know, it impacts uh, that a lot. Yeah. Relationships. You know? Yeah. hundred uh, percent, whether it's wife, uh, kids, family, friends, whatever, it, it, it is not easy by any stretch, you know? Uh, and you just have to make the best of it. We talked about it earlier about, you know, when I was thinking about being, you know, a hundred percent freelance or going in a different direction from the NBA. And I sort of, you know, for the, for family type reasons, um, chose that particular path, you know? Uh, and the good news is, you know, uh, sometimes on a Tuesday afternoon, I was watching one of my kids soccer games because I didn't have a game. Right that night and I was there on a random Tuesday afternoon or something. It's like, it's like anything else you have to, you have to juggle and make, make the best of it. Yeah. Nobody calls out the accountant that can't show up on that Tuesday. Cause he hasn't got out until five. So you know, go, <laughs> go screw you accountant. I'm there. <laughs> right. 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 No, it's, 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 it's a, it's a balance no matter, you know, what your job is. But I think, in our sports world, it's particularly difficult, uh, again, because of nights, weekends, holidays, et cetera, right. that, that you're working. So you do need a very understanding uh, family and spouse. Yeah. They've always keep kind of get, get, getting forgotten. Like, but if you don't have great support at home, th- this job is right. brutal. Right. Uh, yeah, it's, it, it is. It's, it's, it's tough. Right. Um, and it's a, you know, I get home, I get home at midnight and, you know, my kids are grown now, but it was like getting home from a normal day at midnight, getting up, you know, for getting them breakfast off to school right. and then forget about like putting in, uh, you know, when you're traveling. Oh God. Yeah. Crazy. <laughs> we had a crazy story. My son was graduating kindergarten, which is in June it was game seven of the Lakers series. I was in LA and had to, had to get out that night to make his graduation. Um, and they closed the arena because there was so much craziness the going riots on outside. Yeah. There were riots at, and, and like, we, we got to go, uh, running through the parking lot, flipped over cars, things on fire. Yeah, the cop car was on and, fire. Yeah. 
Garrett Elwood, who you had on a different <laughs> podcast, was was uh, was kind enough to drive me to the airport. We're going around beeping, trying to find out because he had forgotten where he parked the car. I'm like, really, dude? Beeping the beeper <laughs> on, on rental van. And oh, by the way, uh, I am drenched in champagne from the locker room celebration. I'm going through the airport. We we do make it to, to LA. I'm going through the airport. People are like, you know, standing away from me. I, I reeking of of alcohol to get on the red eye, um, to get on the red eye home. And this is post September eleventh. Uh, so you're already looking crazy. Yeah. yeah. Uh so literally uh freshen up a little. Uh, once I was on the plane, just trying to splash water, change change my shirt, <laughs> land, home, shower, boom, uh, to to uh, to graduation. Yeah, uh, that's what that's what we do. That's what dads know? do, right? Get it done. Uh, yeah. Now the kids are older; they don't care what I'm doing. <laughs> Dad, you got a game? Okay, I'll see you tomorrow. Yeah, yeah whatever. Yeah. See ya. Whatever. Whatever. <laughs> what you um, mentioned the ones you've missed. What's What's it's hard to say your best photo, but what's one if somebody said, "Hey, Nat, can you make me a print of what you really would like to give me?" What would that image be? You know, it's hard because something will something will be a favorite for a while, but then I want I want something else. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, and I've been fortunate over a longer career now to have, you know, a couple of different of the more iconic moments. Mm -hmm. Like I'll never forget my first, it was uh, magic Johnson's like junior, junior sky hook against the Celtics was 1987. Right. Like that was my favorite for a while. And magic um, magic said it was one of his favorite pictures, which made me, you know, uh, made me proud. Uh, you know, if you're a Knicks fan, you like the John Starks dunk, of course. Right. You know, um, there's there's different uh, memorable moments like that. There's some of the Kobe stuff brought back a lot of memories because I didn't, you know, being on the East Coast, like I knew Kobe, uh, the 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 name Kobe because of his high school years in Philly, you right. know. Um, but I didn't see him quite frankly a lot. No, you uh, would have to get around, right? Yeah, like I would see him in Philly, New York, Jersey at the time, whatever. Right. You know, I it was like Andy in 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 L.A. shooting him fifty times a year. You know, um, but have a great uh, shot that I like of him in the in the shower actually after they won with the trophy down at his feet, and he's yeah. just really pensive. You know, thing I like those emotional kind of shots um uh, we talked about like the portrait stuff I, I love the bill russell with his you know the rings it's 10 fingers and, and 11 rings right you know talk about like, that that image because i you know was that a lot of work with bill or, or did you just kind of um you know that was for the nba at 50 um the nba celebrated its 50th uh, anniversary which was 25 years ago um and we were we were so fortunate to be able to to they named the players and they and they were doing a at that time they were doing a book so they needed imagery of you know current things of portraits um, and we sort of had a little bit of creativity a license to do what we wanted to which now would have to be approved by 47 different people and things were a little different and we were under the gun time wise to get things done. So that was the obvious choice for, for Russell, you know, mm -hmm. uh, but the crazy story is he doesn't have 11 rings. We had to borrow some rings from his teammates to, to signify the 11 rings, right. you know, uh, they didn't win um, they didn't win rings. They didn't get rings every year, which is a crazy story in and of itself. Yeah. Uh, that you just assume you, they're like, Oh, after you, you got a couple of one year, he got cufflinks one year. He got this. I'm like, what? Um, well, they so probably thought whole... after three or four, oh, God, how many rings can a guy wear? Give him some cufflinks. Correct. Correct. So there's a whole story behind that of what, 
you know, him in particular actually received. So we literally, and by the way, technically that was tricky to shoot because you wanted the rings to signify the whole thing is he won 11 champions. It's unheard of 11 championships in 13 years. So you have 10 fingers. So you, you double one up, but again, I, and I, and I, vividly remember I'm shooting with the Hasselblad, the 120, his face is so iconic, oh, you know, that moment, but have to light it a certain way, have to have my depth of field a certain way. So you see the ring, but I don't want to see someone else's name on the ring, mm -hmm. you know? So if you were to look at it carefully, um, there's very shallow uh, depth of field, like right on his, right on his eyes. Right. Um, but that was that, like very fortunate again just as a fan mm -hmm. to be able to do that and that same for that same project i was able i i photographed wilt chamberlain uh so like oh. it doesn't get any better like no uh and trying to think of an idea we had trouble trying to come up with an idea uh for him for that um but he was up at kutcher's was their old summer camp and i took a i took a picture of a portrait of him up there um, so things like that are very, very fortunate to have been a, been a part of that. Yeah. And then this, then this year, it's a sort of a cool story. Um, we did a group shot of the 50 greatest NBA players. And at that time, uh, pistol Pete had passed away and Shaq was injured actually. Uh, so he wasn't in the photo, but there were 48 out of the 50 guys were in the photo uh and then this year happened to be the 75th anniversary of the nba so we did a we did a picture of the 75 uh greatest nba players um and unfortunately now just 25 years have passed a number of guys uh in that 25 years have have passed away right right but pretty cool when you look up and you see Kareem talking to Magic, talking to Jerry West, talking to like you. I'm looking through the camera and I'm like, wow, this is pretty cool, you know? Yeah. Um, and stuff, stuff like like that gives me chills still. Oh, you know? Yeah, you start never, to never take that, never take that for granted. No. Little nerve wracking, little nerve wracking, um, but you can never take that. If if you take something like that for granted, it's time to to get a different job right you know yeah as simple as that or, you know uh i i like uh still very jazzed about those types of things you yeah know? if you don't have nerves before that photo shoot then i don't know what you're doing right yeah move uh, on <laughs> yeah yeah no that was, and by the way someone then gave me a it was sort of a closed like we had to construct bleachers and lights and it was a huge, you're talking about 70, a group of 75 is not easy to shoot. No. And they're uh, large men. Correct. Uh, and then it's like, where do you place them? You know, some of the more elderly in front, they're not climbing up on the bleachers, you know, right. that kind of thing. Um, but it was just cool. It's just cool as a fan. And then someone gave me a, a picture of like a behind the scenes shot. And I wasn't even aware of it. Um, as I'm shooting, there were probably a hundred people ended up being in the room that was supposed to be somewhat private. Everyone with with different cameras and phones, and I'm up a little bit because I knew I had to get eye level, you know. So I did get up a little bit, right. but literally, there's probably a hundred, you know, team personnel, family personnel that escorted the guys in. Uh, and everyone with a camera and a phone was kind of a, a cool uh, BTS kind of shot, oh, you know? Oh, God. You touched on a little bit, and my wife's, I got her now to start watching it, the last dance with the Bulls, that last run. What was yep. that like for you to be a part of it when that was you know happening? What? At, it was cool, but at the time, like, that's my job. Like, you, I always loved MJ, like who didn't love MJ, but we were like focused on our job, you know? Were you tough on uh, yourself to make sure you got this, got this and got that? Yeah, like that. Yes. An answer to yes. You know, there's always things like, oh, I wish I did this. I wish it, but you, sometimes you don't like, I, I love all that behind the scenes 
stuff, mm -hmm. you know? Um, but the last dance, you know, was sort of like the perfect storm with the COVID, everyone watching at the original time. Yeah. I was like everybody else, every son, like I had seen trailers and different, but I had never seen the whole thing. But my kids and I, every Sunday watching that, like the rest of the world, literally, were, mm -hmm. were watching that, you know, um, <laughs> and then they would ask me questions if they'd see me in one of the frames or something, dad, what was it like? And that was cool for me just as a fan, you know, because they're older now, mm -hmm. you know, uh, they're 20 something, you know, mid twenties and asking and seeing, and they're like, wow, Michael was tough. Huh? And I was like, yeah, he was pretty tough, uh, yeah. you know? Uh, but it was very, it was very cool uh, just to have been a, been a part of that and a fly on the wall. Right. Uh, for, for that. We're, for sure. we're, we're watching it now. And I'm like, Oh, that's, that's not, he's going to be on the podcast. You'll, you'll be on again. That's and I'm, she's like, okay, I get it. He's on no, the podcast. No, no. <laughs> okay. uh, and then I'll go, that's Phil Smith. I want to get him on the podcast. Yeah. Okay. All right. right. Have you seen it before or is it your first time? No, as I've well? seen it before. Yeah. Okay. I saw, I like right. you, I saw it when it came out and she's like, eh, right. I don't really think so. And I'm like, just sit through the first one. And then she was hooked. Right. She had no right. idea Michael was that laser focused intense. I'm like, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And, and like it, it pretty, pretty incredible. Yeah. It's funny. It's funny. Uh I never, I never like I, I do my Instagram a little bit of Twitter, like with the you know, pictures. And during that COVID time, I was doing a lot of the last dance stuff. Right. And there was great engagement with people because I was doing some behind the scenes, you know, photos and some of the stuff people hadn't seen before, you know. Uh, but just the other day, uh, John ja Morant said, uh, you know, that he would he would destroy or he would cook Michael Jordan in a one on one, you know, and that's what players Right. That's what players do. Like there's a video of Kyrie as a 19 year old or 20 year old challenging Kobe, mm -hmm. you know, and Kobe going, who are you again? Like, <laughs> you know, that's what, that's what makes these guys who they are. Like I, I respect that. Yeah. Right. John, John Moran is going to cook Michael and I never comment on stuff, but I couldn't help myself. I was playing with my phone, lying in bed and it's like, you know what? John might be right because Michael is now 59 years old. <laughs> and 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 pe people went crazy and i was like i didn't respond i just said that because i love ja i love jaw's game sure. like I, I i love but i just thought that that was funny yeah, he might beat michael because michael's getting older he's 59 now so he, he, he might have a shot against him you know um, oh, that's good that's good fun. if you're gonna you do have, that <laughs> you have to have some fun right uh, let's talk about this because you said it's you finished it up, but it was the the Alzheimer's Foundation, the the fun you were raising. Tell me about that. Right. What what does that mean? You know what? Um, it's a it's a organization that has been near and dear to both my wife and I. Her mom is is suffering from Alzheimer's, um, so we have done some uh, some fundraising uh, over the years for that. Um, my son actually, I was very proud of him. He, as a, he graduated college, all his friends were going to Jamaica to party or something. He didn't want to do that. He rode his bicycle, uh, from Santa Monica to Montauk, my hometown to raise money, uh, for that. Just as a, before he started work after college, he, uh, he rode his bike and I forget 3,400 miles or something. He raised money for that. Wow. Uh, which was, I was very, very proud of, of him for that. Uh, I recently last fall um, did the, the New York marathon as a, as a fundraiser for that. Uh, and it was fun for me um, just to challenge myself to do something that required discipline. We were talking about that before health and eating right. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's for me personally, it's, it's been, you know, kids and work. The kids are older now. Work is somewhat stable. I wanted to do something 
uh, for myself and then also uh, to, to donate uh, to a good, a good cause. So we raised, we raised some money uh, by me running, running the marathon. How was that? You know what? It was fun. I did one 10 years ago. Okay. Um, And a lot has happened with my body in the last 10 years. The first (laughs) one, I was like, hey, this isn't too bad. This one was uh, a struggle. Um, Boy, what a decade makes. (laughs) Right? I ran with my son. I had visions of these romantic notion of us training together and all we we trained together twice in in 6 months he uh i thankfully it was a beautiful day and new york is so cool um i you know had the, had music right i didn't even turn the music on until like mile 18 it was a beautiful day the streets were packed people cheering you do get motivated i was not up with the kenyans i was back with right, just but you could see them. the normal, the normal folks. But you, but you uh, were able to see the Kenyans. They weren't too far ahead. I, of you. I, I think they were already doing their TV appearances. Uh, and Jen, Jensen, my son, actually, he he right at the he dusted me right at the beginning. He went he went to uh, I had gotten a hotel the night before to stay in. He took went back, took a shower, met me at the finish line. <laughs> Uh, but it was, it was, uh, it was a lot of fun. I, I, I did it. It was just one of those things to, you know, to set a goal. Like I said, we raised, we raised some money for, for a great cause. Uh, and it was a good, you know, family bonding, uh, experience. So thank you for, uh, for mentioning that. That's great though. I mean, doing something for your mother-in-law, you're challenging yourself, you know, you're trying to have a moment with your child. Of course, he, he bails on you, but that's a typical yeah. kid. <laughs> yep. Uh, no, I, I think it's important to to do, you know, even this this whole aspect now with what's going on in the world, like the conversation of mental health and mm-hmm. things like our, our schedules and lifestyle is not is not easy. You're you know? right. That's why I brought it up. It's we, we, people have no clue. It, it, it's not it's not easy. Uh, and. It, it, it is a grind. In order to be successful, it is a grind. Most jobs, in order to be successful, is a grind. And there is a balance between your work and your family and your health, mm-hmm. both physical both physical and mental. And that has been become more important to me as I get older, like the physical side, obviously, for all the other. But then you look, you look back on it uh, and, you know, you, you, you have to balance things. You know, and everyone says like you, you're not. No one ever says, "Oh, I wish I worked more." Uh, I wish, you know, I don't want to miss birthdays. I don't. I want. You know, I want to be there. You know, mm-hmm. uh, and that's what we all we all need to do. Right. It it's so yeah. funny. We you know we talked about like how early you get to a game. People don't realize the amount of work that is put in to photograph an NBA game. I. I I've had a couple of my brother or brother-in-laws say like, Oh, I'd love to go to a game with you. I said, all right, well meet me at my house at 10. Well, the right. game's not till seven. Yeah. Right. But we got to get through. No, I've, had, I've had people, I've had people in our, in our NBA office, like interested in photography. I'm always like, because of, of, of the people that have helped me, I'm always like a, a, a play it forward kind of mm-hmm. guy. I'll help sure. anyone. And I've had people even in our, in our photo group in the NBA office <laughs> say what I can't get there at 12. Like really? That's what time you get there. Yeah. Yeah. You know, um, I would love and, to show up at six 30, but <laughs> you know, that's, that's just, that's just, that's just, you know what it is. And I like, I live in a commuter town and people take, you know, people hop on the train to go into New York city on the, the five ten train in the morning. And, and get home at seven o'clock at night or something. There's a, there's a balance for all of us, no matter what our career is. Mm -hmm. I think it, you know, as a, again, a parent to, to three kids. Now my, my advice just always has been to them though. You have, you do have to uh, follow your passion a little bit because then it doesn't, those, those days don't all seem like work, right? you know? 
uh, there's a work component. It's, you know, we're not living in the fantasy world. You have to work. Uh, but you you have to enjoy what you do. Right. Uh, and I've been been very blessed that even after all this time, I do get geeked up to go to a game. This year's NBA Finals was fun, you know. Uh, I was geeked up for I wanted a game seven, have Steph hit a winning shot, go create. Like, I want, like, I still, I love that, you know. Um, so I'm very, I'm very fortunate. Do you have, okay, which, which one is more probable? Another race for you, or maybe you'll pull out a Hasselblad and shoot a game with it. Awesome question. I would say I'll go with the, uh, I'll go with the, uh, pulling out a Hasselblad. (laughs) That's better on your knees. Better on my knees. Now, if you said a bike ride, maybe that would be different. I I think I I could, I could be, uh, I could be done with my, uh, I could be done with my marathons. Did Uh, the the Hasselblad, I still have, they're on the shelf. I still, you kept, you know, you know what I get, I get a little bit sentimental about Think like I know what I know what picture I took with that camera. I know what picture, and you know I have traded in some things over the years. But typically, I wait too long, and then it's not worth anything. Right. Um, and the equipment is a big is a big expense. Huge. I baby, I baby my stuff. Like I've I've shot Canon ever since uh, I switched to digital. I've been Canon. But I baby those things, like take care of them, wrap, wrap them, them right. like uh, the you know. Um, I played with a little bit of the mirrorless stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, I w- I will probably make a segue in the next round, just based on what we do is very unique. I don't need the twelve frames a second, fifteen frames a second. Yeah, you you're know, on lights. It's not it's not what I do. Uh, I need. I need more of the durability, more of the reliability. Mm -hmm. Uh, But some of those new, uh, those new lenses and stuff are incredible. The, the RF lenses. Right. If there's, if there's any Canon reps out there listening, (laughs) hook a brother up, hook a man up, take care. I got got college tuitions I'm paying for. I got, you know, (laughs) um, but uh, I, I sold yeah. my stuff. I, I couldn't, I couldn't let it just sit there and depreciate in front of me. So I ended up like just going to Sammy's and crying in the parking right. lot and turning it over. And, and like you, I knew yeah. like, Oh man, that viewfinder, I saw this do that and the grip and all yeah. the backs and Oh, oh right. It was tough. No, I, I, I sold a couple of, or traded in a couple of things. Um, I had an RZ system for the, for, that it was like almost a little RZ and possible too much of the same. Mm-hmm. I got rid of the RZ stuff because that I would never use at a game. Yeah, I tried no. it. It was a little too cumbersome. Um, but the Hasselblad, I still, uh, I still have most of it. Wow. That, you know, I, I don't know. Did you ever try digital on it? You know what? Uh, I haven't. Um, and there is a remote position that it would be beautiful for, like in the basketball, in the cutout. Okay. In the um, neck, right there, yeah. It, it adds to a nice square format that I would like to try. Um, the backs were crazy right. expensive. Yeah, that's the, that's the downside. Um, I don't know if they've gone down, but I want to say like $18,000 or something for the bag. I can't. No, I can't. you can't justify yeah. it. That's the issue. Uh, not if you're shooting an ad campaign in a studio or something like that makes sense. But for, again, just like I don't need the 20 frames a second motor drive, what we do is very niche and I have to make my decisions, like try to remove some emotion from it and do what is, what is ultimately the most practical. Well, if I could get 15,000 of my closest friends to all smoke cigarettes, come to a basketball game and put you on a Hasselblad with some film. I'm on a flight out east immediately. Right? Let's do it. Cigars, maybe. We could even get fancy and go yeah, to cigars. Absolutely. Of the and we need right? half the people. We don't need that many. There we go. Now, there this has go. been an absolute pleasure. 
I can't thank you enough for your crazy time to make time for me to do this. Uh, it has been absolutely awesome. No, thank, thank you. I'm glad we were, we were finally able to do it. And it is, it is fun for me to, uh, to rehash some of, some of these, uh, some of these memories and stuff. And there's still, there's still a lot more in the tank. So we, we, we can do it again. Absolutely. Absolutely. We could do it after either your next Hasselblad or your next marathon, whatever's up to you. There you, there, there you go. They, when, there's a, when there's a championship parade down Broadway for uh, oh. Brooklyn or, or the Knicks or something. Oh, it's got to be the Knicks first. Uh, you can't see Brooklyn going down the Avenue of the champions. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, that's right. They would do it on uh, Flatbush Avenue. Yeah, on Flatbush. And God knows that hasn't happened since the Brooklyn Dodgers right. were there. <laughs> right. right. Well, holding out hope. Matt, you're the best. I appreciate it, my friend. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me, Matt. Absolutely. All right. So long. Hey, when are you there? When you get a chance, yes. could you send me, um, like, I don't know, two or three photos of you? You like you've, you got a... a traditional headshot or some promo photos of you so I can, um, I will, I will look to have to, I have to do that. Yes. Okay. Uh, but I, I can, I can do that. Sure. They can be from the eighties if you want. Right. <laughs> yeah. A little, a little feathered hair. And, yeah. yeah I, saw, I saw that, uh, I did the guy that did the podcast and had that photo of you and Andy from, uh, like a Dallas all-star um, game from like, 80. you know what? Every, every, no, every so often Andy will find a, you know, again, it's an old chrome of, of something and right. he'll, he'll send it to me, you know, oh, and, uh, it's funny. Yeah. And that goes back to taking a look at your archive. Like I was the same way, like, you know, you would randomly pregame, take a couple of pictures of each other, but we didn't do selfies right. or that many. It no. might've been like somebody up on a ladder or something. <laughs> exactly. But now, like everybody's got photos of each other. It's right. right. <laughs> like, no, it's funny. During the finals this year, we took one with this other guy, uh, buddy of mine, Joe Murphy, who shoots in Memphis. And I was like, Joe, we never do this. We should do this. And we made a point of we each took a picture of each other. But I wish I had more pictures of like the gear right. or all the speed on, like at the airport, that kind of stuff. Oh my god. But we never, we never did that. I, if I could take a portrait of every sky cap, I had to slip an extra twenty-two to there get done as right. shit onto the plane because right. he yeah. had to wait forever because he's a goddamn slowpoke. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, uh, that's fun. That, uh, but thanks for this. It was, it was a lot of fun. I, I really appreciate it. No, it, no, trust me, it, it's all my pleasure. It was awesome. Uh, and we'll we'll be in be in touch. Okay, thank you, my friend. Talk to you soon. All right, All right. you got Bye-bye. it. All right, so long. Thank you for listening to my conversation with Nat Butler. If you enjoyed the episode, please hit the like button and become a subscriber to the podcast. Remember, you can follow the Just Good Conversation podcast on Instagram, and you can find all of our past shows on the website at justagoodconversation.com. Thank you for listening.